Thanks, Haley. I will begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father, we uh, thank you for this day. Again, Lord, I thank you for these students. Just ask you to bless this class. Help us to understand a little bit more about your creation in our time. Lord, in your name I pray. Amen. Okay, so first things first. Um, <clears throat> today we are working our way on the, the road to the spectral theorem. I'm not sure if we'll get there today, but we'll see how far we can get. What is the spectral theorem? Well, I told you before we got there, there would hardly be a point. We'll get there. So to start with, we need some new terms. I may have mentioned these before, but I'll mention them again now. Definition. Um, a in R n by n such that a transpose A equals to I is an orthogonal matrix. Right. This is an orthogonal matrix. Um, and we say A is an element of O and R. So these are orthogonal n by n matrices. If A is an element of O n R and the determinant of A is equal to 1, then A is an element of S O n R. And this is the set of special um, orthogonal. I feel like I'm saying that wrong. Special, special orthogonal matrices. Orthogonal. Orthogonal. All right. Now, in fact, we have another name for these. Um, AKA rotation matrices. Well, the rotation matrix, it's the rotation matrices. All right. Part of the point of your current homework assignment is to kind of flesh out why that's a reasonable thing to say, at least in the context of three dimensions or two dimensions. But yes, if a, if a matrix satisfies the condition A transpose A equals to I, um, and it has determinant one, it turns out that what that means geometrically is it's actually a rotation. Um, on the other hand, uh, it's easy to prove that any orthogonal matrix either has determinant plus or minus one. How would we prove that? So the proof is simply this. A transpose A equals to I implies that the determinant of A transpose times the determinant of A is equal to the determinant of the identity matrix. What's the determinant of the identity matrix? It's one. What's the determinant of the transpose of matrix? Remember the determinant of the matrix and its transpose are equal? So this is just straight up determinant of A squared. So we've got a real number whose square is 1. What's your choices? Plus or minus 1, right? So it turns out that there are two kinds of orthogonal matrices. There are the ones with determinant 1 and there are the ones with the determinant minus one. The determinant minus one correspond to reflections or rotor reflections. In other words, rotations and reflections compo composed. Right. Um, so that's the first order of business. This is what an orthogonal, an orthogonal matrix is and a special orthogonal matrix is, okay? We can also turn the page here and think about a complex matrix. 
if we have u is an element of cn by n, and u, um, u star u is equal to i, where u star is u conjugate transpose, then u is an element of what's called S, sun. Oh, not, there's no S yet, so sorry. un. If the determinant of u is equal to 1 and u is an element of un, then u is an element of S un. So, words. un, these are the unitary matrices. And SUN are special unitary matrices. So these are the complex analog of orthogonal and special orthogonal matrices. Um, a place where they come up, for example, a place where they come up, here's an interpretation of these things, if you like. You could have, say, C, you could have CN repre represent like uh, quantum states. So in that context, um, if you did something like V was an element of CN, then if you do u times v, that's another element of Cn, and it has the same length as, as v. Um, anyway, if you get into quantum mechanics, unitary matrices appear in terms of um, matrices which appear which preserve the, um, the probability. But anyway, I, you know, come on, that's not for here really, right? Anyway, the point is that unitary matrices appear in quantum mechanics, and th that should be enough to say. But they're interesting for us because actually the spectral theorem, which we're most interested in, is the real spectral theorem. But the proof of it half is, is half found in the complex context. So like taking a complex approach will give us an actual pretty easy and general proof of the spectral theorem, all right? So it's worth our time and energy to talk a little bit about the complex case, if nothing else, to give us a better proof for the real case. Now, so that's, these are just both, both definitions I just gave, matrices, right? Just matrix. Now, next up, mm, let me erase this theorem. <clears throat> and just put up here, UN, what is UN? UN is u in cn by n such that u star u equals to i. Okay, there we go. We got it. Now I can erase this over there in a second. Next definition is for what are called orthogonal tr and unitary transformations. All right, definition. If t going from a vector space, an inner product space V to an inner product space V um, over F, which is either equal to the reals or the complexes, okay? We're either thinking reals or complexes here. Nothing snazzier than that. If this is a linear transformation such that, get this, the inner product of T of X with T of Y is equal to the inner product of x and y. All right? <clears throat> For all x and y in v, then number one, if the field is the reals, then we say t is an orthogonal transformation.
And point number two, if the field is the complexes, then we say T is a unitary and unitary transformation. All right. So what do you think we're going to be able to say about a uh, matrix of a orthogonal or um, unitary transformation? Care to guess what the matrix of one of these kinds of transformations is going to look like? No? All right. Let's do a calculation. Let beta v1, v2, da, 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 vn be basis for v. And I'll do the complex case because the real case is in the notes. All right. So let's do the complex case. Let's assume that T is a unitary transformation. All that really says is that T preserves the complex inner product, right? If you act on the vector space by T, the inner product of X and Y is not changed, right? Inner product of X and Y is equal to inner product of T of X and T of Y. That says a lot of different things. That actually says that the length of vectors is maintained. It says the angle between vectors is maintained in the complex sense or the real sense as appropriate. Because remember, we defined length and angle in terms of the inner product and the induced norm. Right? So these orthogonal transformations and unitary transformations seem pretty important. They, they preserve lengths and angles. Right? OK, but anyway, let's get back to the calculation. So how do we find the matrix of T here? What is what is T beta beta? Do you remember what it is? We go what? T of V1 beta coordinate, right? T of V2, the beta coordinate of that, right? T, you guys remember this, right? Usual song and dance. Now, what? Um, Uh, let's see here. How um, I need to connect that to the inner product. Now I'm trying to think here. Um, what? Like, okay, let's try this. What if we calculate the um, ijth component of that? What was that going to be? It should be the, what is that? That's the jth component, right? We take, to get, let's see, um, that's the column index, right? So we're looking at t of vj, right? What's that? No? Oh, oh, OK. And we're trying to find the, so that's you know, the quarter vector of that. And we want to find the ith coordinate of the ith blah, blah, words. The ith coordinate, ith component, right, of that. Oh, I told myself before class, I was going to stick to my notes. Why don't I listen to myself? And what we're doing is not wrong. It's just, it's not helpful. 
Yeah, there's a reason I had this proposition before this. All right, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to back it up here, guys. I, I'm trying to do about 15 different things at once here with this. We're just, yeah, no one to, you know, when to hold them, when to fold them, when to walk away. You know, the rest of it goes. So sorry about that. We will get back to that eventually, and we will shockingly learn that the matrix of a unitary transformation is unitary. But before we do that, I need to lay the groundwork. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> proposition. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, guys. I could take my own advice. You know, I made the mistake of preparing for class today. Um, so selecting components via inner products. Proposition 9.6.1. Let y be an element of the vector space. All right, and T from V to V linear transformation. Then, now one of these we've already proved in a previous lecture, right? First of all, we can write Y as the sum I equals 1 to N of, oh, there's, there's more fine print here. The other fine print is let beta equal to v1 through vn be orthonormal. Orthonormal basis for v. All right, so with respect to an orthonormal basis, remember we can take any vector and we can rip it apart. Its components are given by the inner product of y with vi. Right? And here's the new thing, point two. The ijth component of t beta beta, all right, is equal to, and here it is, the inner product of t of v, vj, with vi. There's an important assumption that I had not made in the thing I erased which was orthonormality of the basis. Kind of important assumption. If we don't do that, um, then I don't think I have the result. I forgot that. Oops. Sorry about that. Um, OK, so we already proved one in a previous lecture. And the proof of two, I almost had on the board until I erased it. Let's do it again. So what is, what is the matrix of t beta beta? the ijth component, well, that is equal to, we look at t of vj, right, the beta coordinate of that, and we calculate the ith component of that. But how do you calculate the ith component with respect to an orthonormal basis? You take the inner product of the given vector with that basis element, right? So by our previous results, this is nothing more than the inner product of t of vj with the i, which is what I claimed. So this is nice. We can calculate the components of the matrix of a linear transformation on an inner product space with respect to an orthonormal basis simply by calculating an appropriate inner product of the image of the transformation and the basis. This is a really nice formula. All right. Now the next theorem that I was trying to uh, jump the gun on before I wrote this was the so next theorem: if um, t from v to v as above is unitary then the matrix of T beta beta is in UN. So I'm saying that assume V is an inner product space with basis beta, which is orthonormal. That's, I'm still assuming that, okay? Okay, so to prove that that matrix, all I have to do is in, 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 all I have to do is prove that that matrix, as I currently have the theorem stated, this is an if-then thing, all right? 
Um, so what do I have to prove? I need to prove that, and I probably should give it, I should probably say let A equal to T beta beta so we don't go nuts writing T beta beta a thousand times, right? So with that, by two of proposition proposition 9.6.1 right there, we have A I J is equal to what? The inner product of T of V J with V I. So what do we need? We need to check the, the unitary condition, right? That U star U is equal to the identity matrix again. So consider. Well, in, the, in our context, it's our, our U is A, right? So consider A star A is equal to what? Well, I should probably be more careful. Let's look at the um, ijth component of that, right? So that's matrix multiplication. How do we do it? Sum over k, right? Of a star i k a k j, right? And what's that equal to? So that is a k i conjugate times a k j. So that the star is conjugate transpose, right? So it flips the indices and then it complex conjugates the entry. That's what star means. Okay? Then we got to go back to, you know, this bit right here. So what's that tell me? T, what, what's, so AKI would be what? T of VI comma VK, right? Complex conjugate of that. And what would this um, AKJ be? T of VJ comma VK, I think, right? By this. Can we simplify that? Remember how the inner product works? This is the sum over k of what? I guess vk comma tv. Well, I'm not sure that actually helps. Man, why am I not following my notes? <laughs> uh. Oh, 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 I'm an idiot. Um, dang. I am, uh, I'm just doing badly today. <laughs> I guess, uh, you know, um, what's one giant thing I haven't used that's kind of like the only thing to use that I haven't even started to look at calculationally. I mean, I can write this down. This is VK, T of VI, inner product T of VJ, VK. I mean, great. Yay, there it is. That is a identity which would be true for any linear transformation. I haven't used that T is unitary, right? I, I, did I use, I didn't even use that, did I? That's the one thing I should be looking at here in this proof. It's the one thing I've ignored. So, duh. Let's actually look at the unitary condition and see what it tells us. What does the unitary condition tell us? It tells us that if we have VI, VJ, that's equal to the inner product of T of VI with T of VJ. Right, that's, that's the condition. And so, 
by the way, this is also the sum over, let's say, k of a. Let's see here. How's that go? Um, I always forget the order of the indices here. So that's supposed to be a k i v k. And then the sum over L, let's say, of A, L, J, the L. Let me get rid of the squiggly. So the inner product, of course, is what... Um, so this gives us the sum over k and l of a, k, i, a, l, j. Can you guys tell me what I have to do to the l, j when I pull it out of that sum? I mean, out of the inner product. Which entry did I pull it from? I, I pulled it from the second entry, right? So by definition, we have to complex conjugate that, that, con, that, that, that complex constant, right? So this is supposed to be complex conjugate. Well, I just feel like an idiot. This is all we needed to do. This is lovely up here, and I probably should save it for later, but I'm just going to get rid of it. Yeah. The definition of inner product, it says that in, in the complex case, when we pull a scalar out from the second entry, we complex conjugate it. That is needed in order that like the induced norm makes sense, um, that we end up getting like modulus from formulas because modulus is built from the juxtaposition of like complex number and its conjugate. So if you don't have that conjugate from the second entry, you won't get the modulus that you need in the formulas to make things real is, is the, you know, ultimate backstory to that axiom. But this right here, guys, this is Kronecker delta K, K, KL, right? Because we're working with an orthonormal basis. And by the way, this is Kronecker IJ, Right? And so look what, look what just happened. We've got Kronecker delta ij equal to a sum. Let's keep, which one do you want to keep, k or l? The k? OK. And eh, eh, I'm an idiot. All right, a, a um, k, j, conjugate. A, I'm, and what am I doing here, guys? I am reordering the order of the A's to see my purpose. Or maybe I'm, I chose poorly. Ah! So sorry, guys. I'll get it eventually. A, K, I, A, conjugate, K, J. All right. Aha! What'd that say? That says, it's not quite what I want, but it's related to what I want, and it'll work for us. So this is a transpose. Good grief, I write conjugate. Transpose, IK, right? A conjugate, KJ. And so what we got is a transpose times a conjugate, IJ. Since this holds for all IJ, what we've just shown is that the transpose of A times A conjugate is equal to the identity matrix. That's not what I wanted, right? That's not the unitary condition, but what can you do to that equation? See, because I want, I want an A star, which is a conjugate transpose. How do I make a conjugate transpose appear? Take the transpose of the equation, indeed. So taking the transpose gives me by sock shoes a conjugate transpose, a transpose transpose equals to i transpose. This is otherwise known as a star a equals to i. So there you go. That's the other direction. That's the, what's not shown in the nodes. All right. So, 
Anyway, in summary, and this is actually if and only if, because you can reverse this argument. If you assume that the matrix, if there exists an orthonormal basis, rather, with respect to such that with respect to that orthonormal basis, the matrix of the transformation is either orthogonal or unitary, then it follows that the transformation itself is also orthogonal or unitary as appropriate. So you can reverse this argument because if you have that pattern for the matrix, the calculation is reversible and it will transfer back to give you that this is equal to that on a basis. And if, if we preserve the inner product on a basis, it follows that by the linearity properties that you can get it for every arbitrary pairs. So this actually is if and only if. Uh, a transformation's orthogonal if and only if it has an orthogonal matrix. A transformation's unitary if and only if it has a unitary matrix with respect to an orthonormal basis. Yeah. Oh, OK. Sorry, I know it's kind of a mess. Really not much going on here. Um, real case. Let, let me just, the real case, if, we, if we're just looking at, I mean, let me just make it th simp things simpler here for a second. Think about Rn, right? If we have a, a, a trans, an orthogonal transformation on Rn, then if you look at, you know, we've got x comma y is equal to the inner product of t of x, t of y, right? But what does that mean in the, in the case of Rn? with the dot product. This is nothing more than x transpose y, right? And so if we let t of x equals to ax, right? Let a be the matrix, the standard matrix of t, then this is just straight up ax transpose times ay by the definition of inner product being dot product and dot product being the product of the, of the row times the column involved, right? But then by sock shoes, this is x transpose a transpose a y. And so what you got? You got x transpose y. By the way, if you look carefully at Sildred and Squint, you can see you got an identity matrix between the x transpose and y on that side. This is true for all x and y in Rn. And that implies that i is equal to a transpose a. So this, this result is easier to prove if we pick the specific real vector space Rn and we just look at the interplay between the standard matrix of an orthogonal transformation. Right. We learn pretty quickly that the matrix of an orthogonal transformation is an orthogonal matrix by that calculation. Okay. We just were suffering through like, you know, working with the abstract basis and coordinates and all that junk in what I have in the middle board. And also, it's the complex case. All right, so next, next up. <coughs> Sorry, I'm taking my sweet time getting to the uh, important stuff to say today. I feel like I could have said everything I've said up to this point cleanly in about 10 minutes. <sighs> so sorry. Definition. And this one's new. This one's really new. T from V to V, a linear transformation on finite dimensional inner product space. All right, with orthonormal basis. beta equal to v1, v2, vn, all right? Then we define t star from v to v, which is called the adjoint. the adjoint of t, all right, by, and this is my definition, guys. It's not the definition you'll find in a lot of textbooks, but I wanted to give a definition in these notes which was explicit in the sense that I'm giving you a formula for t star. Here it is. 
it's the sum i equals 1 to n of y with t of vi, vi. What, what do you, how do you think the matrix of the adjoint is going to be related to the matrix of T? If we're using, I say if we're using an orthonormal basis, it should be understood every single stupid thing I'm saying in this section is with respect to an orthonormal basis. All right? If I have neglected to say that somewhere, do not construe my comment to be for an arbitrary basis. These are all orthonormal basis comments. All right? Good news, they exist. All right? <clears throat> you guys can guess. What's the matrix? How, I mean, well, let's work it out. What's the matrix of T star with respect to the beta basis? How do we do that? We just learned that a second ago. What's the ijth component of it? How do we do that? We did what? How'd it go? Was it T of, T of Vj, comma Vi, right? Except here, we're doing the T star operator, right? So that's the formula for the ijth component of the matrix, just from definition of orthonormal basis and how we calculate components. Okay, so then now I got to use the definition that I just wrote up here. What's that, what happens then? We got the sum i equals 1 to n of, let's see here, vj. Oh, and i is a bad choice, right? i is already used up here. I got to use some other letter other than i. So we could restate this definition with what, like L, right? L, L. So, great. Um, L, L then. L equals 1 to N of Vj, comma, T of Vl, Vl, that is still inner product with the i, right? Great. So by the properties of the inner product, I can pull out the sum over L and this number, namely Vj with T of Vl. And what I got left is I got inner product of Vl with Vi. Aha, but we're working with an orthonormal basis. So what's that? get away this, this hideous rag. This is Kronecker delta Li, right? By or, I mean, that is orthonormality right there. And so this sum over L collapses, and we just get what? Vj, right? Comma, T of the i. Which, by the way, is equal to what? I need some space to work. Ah. Curses. Mm. Ah. Guess I've worked myself into a corner. So we got literally Vj, T of Vi. What happens? We can take, I mean, I'm trying to, um, how, does, how does this relate? What, what's the matrix of um, T beta beta? What's the ijth component of this? Can you tell me? Remember, it was t of what? t of vj comma vi, right? So how does this and that, how do these relate? How do you get from here to here? Mm. 
let me say it a different way. If we calculate the jth component of this, right, how do these relate? Oh, now that's easier. This is complex conjugation. See, because the complex conjugate of an inner product is equal to, remember? One of our axioms, if we take the complex conjugate, it just flips it. But that, now these are equal, right? So what I've just shown you is that the matrix of T beta beta transpose is equal to the matrix of T star beta beta um, conjugate. Because they have the same ijth entry. And then you take the transpose of that, and that gives you that the matrix of the adjoint is, in fact, the um, conjugate transpose of the matrix of the original transformation. So the star notation is, like, not unreasonable. Now, guys, we are trying to do abstract linear algebra here. And so I have committed a cardinal sin. Um, in particular, I've just used a particular choice of basis to define a fundamental object. Right? I just define the adjoint in terms of the particular basis beta. Is there one orthonormal basis for an inner product space? How many different orthonormal bases are there? One of the theorems that we should understand or learn or run across at some point soon is that if you take a orthogonal transformation and you take the image, you know, if you, well, you can almost see it from the definition. If I take an orthogonal transformation, right, and I take the image of an orthonormal basis under that orthogonal transformation, the image, the new basis, T of beta, will again be orthonormal. See, because T of VI times, with T of VJ, the inner product of those two things, is equal to VI VJ, which shows you that if the, you know, VI with VJ is chronic or delta before, then T of VI with T of VJ is chronic or delta afterwards, if T is orthonormal. I mean, excuse me, if T is orthogonal. So literally any orthogonal transformation, the image of the basis under that will be a new orthonormal basis. There are infinitely many of them, because there's lots and lots of different orthogonal transformations. How many different rotations are there, for example? Right? You can rotate by this much, or this much, or this much. I mean, infinitely many different rotations. So, for shame, I have given you a definition which depends on coordinates, right? So how do you, how do you make up for such a sin? You have to show that while your, court, while your definition has the apparent dependence on coordinates, it's actually not an honest-to-goodness dependence. In other words, if I use a different orthonormal basis, I would still get the same T star. Right? That's, that's what I have to prove here. And so, that is what I will show you now. But I think I have finally found enough common sense not to like, write it out on the board. <laughs> because this one's kind of, I mean, it's straightforward, but it's just a lot of writing. Well, okay, that's not entirely honest. You guys probably won't think it's straightforward. And that's why other authors have the good sense to define it. Um, ah, yes, the Benjamin. Let's see here. Implicitly, where was I? All right, so here it is, the proof I was talking about. So I had more common sense. You know, I was thinking about this stuff today. I thought, oh, man, if I play my cards right today, we'll, we'll get to the spectral theorem. Ah, ah, not likely. This is why there are two days on the syllabus for it, <laughs> because I had more common sense when I wrote that syllabus. <laughs> There is a lot to get 
lot to discuss here before we get to that theorem, unfortunately. Well, no, it's not unfortunate. It's fun stuff. Um, okay, so, um, so what I do is I pick another orthonormal basis, W1 through Wn, right? And we can relate beta and gamma by some invertible matrix P for which Wi is equal to the sum over Pik Vk. So this is the change of basis matrix to go from my orthonormal basis gamma to the orthonormal basis beta, which was stated in the definition. I want this to be arbitrary gamma for my initial beta. And check out what happens here. What kind of matrix relates to orthonormal basis? What do you want to guess? You're like an orthonormal matrix, to which I would say, we have never defined such a thing. We talk about orthogonal matrices. It's annoying, but true. But look what happens, yeah. Um, so we take, um, expand, expand, pull out the constants, the conjugate constants, use the orthonormality of the Vs to collapse the sum over L to keep K equals to L, and then recognize that that is the Kjth component of the conjugate transpose of that matrix. In other words, what we're looking at is that the identity matrix has components which are equal to P times P star. In other words, if you have two orthonormal bases, they are related by a multiplication by a unitary matrix. Or if we were to look at the real corresponding real calculation, they'd be related by an ortho orthogonal matrix. Um, okay, anyway, and then so what I'm doing here is I'm calculating the formula for T star with respect to the gamma basis. So I start with the formula for T star in terms of the gamma basis, and then I take the gamma basis and I convert it to the beta basis, like a so. And then I pull the P's out. I use that we worked out that the P's are unitary, so this collapses to that, which collapses to this, which collapses to, check it out, the formula in the gamma basis and the formula in the beta basis, they're the same. So while there's an apparent basis dependence of the definition, it's actually illusory. Doesn't matter which basis you use, you get the same T star. Which is nice because what's typically done, if you look at, for example, Enzel, Spence, and Friedberg, the definition that they give for the adjoint of a linear transformation is given right here. This is their definition of T star. Now, I don't know about you guys, but that's a little bit unsatisfactory for an introductory, for, for most, I think for students at your level, defining something by an equation like that, it's really kind of obnoxious because then it's like this implicit definition, right? I mean, how do you, def how do you calculate T star then if all you know is it's defined by this? See, in my notes, I've given you a stupid but gory formula to calculate T star. So when in the homework I ask you to find T star of this or that, you know what you got to do. You find a orthonormal basis, you take your inner product, you work out the definition, that's it. It's not a big deal. Um, but anyway, these are properties of the adjoint. It's linear, and it satisfies this, this very, very important relation right here. Really, look at this. You can just think of this identity like this. If you take T and you, you push it past in the inner product to the other spot like that, it becomes star. So that's what, in some sense, the adjoint is. is the transformation you need such that you can take T and make it into T star when you push it across the inner product. That just becomes transpose in the real case. Now, that does not assume, you notice this theorem is not for any kind of special linear transformation. Just for arbitrary linear transformations, this is the case. Okay, so like we're not assuming that T is orthogonal or invertible or anything. This is just a generic identity. You can take an identity transformation, look at its adjoint, and its adjoint will satisfy this relation across the inner product. The proof is right here. So the linearity, first of all, linearity, um, we just, you know, by definition, plug it in there, use linearity in the first slot, and then there you go. There's linearity. Not bad. How do you, oh, look at that. I missed a carrot. <laughs> it's supposed to be T upper star, yeah? This I have not defined. Um, anyway, so uh, 
look at this, vj with t star y is vj with that, but I can pull the conjugate of that constant out front and use the additivity in the second spot. Then, what's next? This is Kronecker delta ji. What happened going from here to here? Do you understand the step? You notice the order of the inner product changed because we take the complex conjugate of it? It flippity floppities, like so. And then, technical term. And then Kronecker delta kills the sum, leaves us with j. And so what this shows is that the identity 2 is true on the basis for v. And if you can prove the identity on the basis, a straightforward argument will show you that you can extend arbitrary elements using the requisite linearity of things involved. All right? So that's, that's it for today. So next time, we'll pick up by discussing um, further properties of the adjoint and then something called the normal operator. This will lead us to Schur's theorem. Schur's theorem leads us to the statement about um, when we can find a basis of um, orthonormal, di an orthonormally diagonalizable, when, when you have diagonalizability and orthonormality of the basis, like you have an eigenbasis, which is also orthonormal in the complex case, and then once we have the complex case on, then we'll have the real case. After the dust settles, what we'll learn is the following. If a real matrix is symmetric, it has an orthonormal eigenbasis. That is a stupidly simple result that we're working our way towards. If the matrix is symmetric, you can not only find an eigenbasis, you can find it orthonormally, and all the eigenvalues are real. That's really nice, because you guys have suffered through calculating eigenvalues, right? You look at an arbitrary matrix, does it have real or complex eigenvalues? That's a long calculation, right? So for me to tell you that it's enough for it to be symmetric to know that the eigenvalues are real, that is, that's nice. And that it's diagonalizable? Wow, what a theorem. That's the spectral theorem. I'll shut up. <laughs>